he stays within a scale, he looks for needs that haven't been filled. Where uh, Tom has the advantage of not being a publicly traded company. And if, if you were to ask me what went wrong with Las Vegas, or what, what has hurt us the most, it's spreadsheets and public trading. Because spreadsheets divorce us from the human emotion that occurs on the floor. And publicly traded companies have to serve quarterly results. That means that they cannot easily invest in things that come long term. Tommy Lardy, as a private person, can try out something. If it doesn't work, he can kill it very quickly and quietly and go on to the next thing. So what you see are the results of what works. But I know from knowing Tom, there's a bunch of things he tried there that did not work. But he's very strategic and he's hands on, mm -hmm. which goes to the non-corporate yep. viewpoint that you express. He's not stuck behind the spreadsheet. He's not. He's involved in all of this process. So how much research do you do when you're designing a space? What, what are you looking at as you're designing a space? Shall I go? Yeah, please. Please. A lot of it starts with interviewing the client and understanding their business goals. Mm -hmm. So even, even Mr. Wynn has business goals. He just approaches it a little differently than, than a, in a corporate environment. So we understand that. We talk about it. We, we, we debate it with them. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, we help our owners come to a conclusion about what it is they're looking for. I mean, there's all the usual process that we go through where we'll do design inspiration sketches and, and work, work a design in a budget because mm -hmm. ultimately they all have budgets. They all have a return on investment calculation. But, but it starts with what's here, what, what these owners believe is going to work. And okay. it, as soon as they start going towards, towards as, as John indicates, spreadsheets <laughs> and, and, and too much of the market survey, they can get lost and they end up with something ordinary. And one of the things that's special about Las Vegas is that we strive for everything to be extraordinary and different. It's what differentiates us and keeps people coming here from the Midwest, from the East Coast, from all over the U.S., and internationally. I mean, we're still a mecca. Mm -hmm. We got hit in a downturn. Now, look, our, our visitation is greater than it's ever been. I think that the income that, that we derive comes from different segments of, of our offerings. Ethan, do you have anything to add? I, I agree with what Leonard's saying. It does start with the client. The client knows their customer base probably better than um, better than anyone, so it, it's pretty much trying to get at that mind meld, especially with a new mm -hmm. client. You know, with, when you've been working with someone for 20, 30 years, it's second nature. Um, but there are a lot of uh, very interesting developer operators out there now who have a very, very strong niche um, understanding of their particular market, and it's, it's the most stimulating thing a designer can be involved with trying to get to know um, who that client is targeting and how to best bring them in. And the space that I work in is gaming, mm -hmm. which is a shrinking space in Las Vegas. Yeah. It's, it's, it's disappearing because other things are able to take its place. The reason Las Vegas specialized in gaming originally is because it was unique and rare. But as we saw gaming proliferate, other people can put those same uh, spaces up. So our, our opportunity now is to, to start thinking about the experience that occurs within those spaces. What happens to people? You asked earlier, what makes people come to a particular property? Now, I'm only talking about the gaming experience, but the number one thing that makes someone come to a given property, if they're a local place, is that they were treated well there the last time. Hmm. It's not the games. It's not the price, it's not the decor, it's did someone care about me? I go to casinos all over the country and I'm amazed to see the number of people, the buses that pull up from nursing homes and, and elderly people that, that I interview and they tell me that this is their experience of the month, that they look forward to coming into this place to take chances to be reminded of what the risk of life was, because they're, they're denied that for the most part now. But 
that if they have a person that works on the floor, a host or someone that remembers their name or brings them a drink, that it makes them feel special. Social encounter. Right? Social encounter. Mm -hmm. And I have a client that believes in this so much that 75% of the time spent by the senior executives is spent on the floor. They know all their regular players, and with player tracking, they can actually see where they're seated, and this is they're absolutely the number one thing. I don't think that happens in Las Vegas. We have so many visitors, and it, it's really a different paradigm here, and it's partly why, why what's happening here is different, why gaming is, I think, shrinking, but, but you can't generate that excitement at a local's yeah. casino. And you gotta be careful here, Las Vegas Strip versus Las Vegas Locals, because if you go out to stations in Boyd, they're probably more concerned about that repeat visitor than we are on the Strip. Agreed. So how is it different designing a gaming space in a structure, in a resort, where the casino is 30 or 35% of the total revenue picture as opposed to being 60 or 70%? How's that change? The implications of the changes in gaming on the spatial layout of casino are, first of all, we're right in the middle of it, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. especially with so much out there, so much product out there. Uh, seeing the seas of carpet at places like um, Mandalay or you know Rio, I mean you can you can fill in the blank. Um, I d I don't think we know the answer to that yet, but w with the existing properties, mm -hmm. but the the change on new properties will be profound because as you point out, it's a fraction of the the space you need, mm -hmm. you know, and then. How do you how to get the tandem tie-ins with the other um, with the other activities when you have a perimeter 110,000 square foot casino perimeter? There's lots of space for all your little belly-up bars and nightclubs and restaurants and all. That. There's a lot of perimeter. If that shrinks to um, I don't know 45,000, 60,000, something like that, it's gonna it's gonna be a big um, it's gonna have huge implications for how we lay out our spaces. Yeah. So adding adding to what Ethan just said, part of what's making Las Vegas different now is that 40 years ago when my grandparents came here, they came to gamble. Mm -hmm. People don't come here to gamble anymore. They come to have an experience. Gambling may be a part of it, but there's so much more nightclubs, shows, and these shows are much different and much grander than, than going and seeing a Rat Pack show, even though those guys were premier entertainers of their time. And, and it's a social experience. And I think that's, you know, that's what's really driving our business now. Everybody's trying to figure out what, what, what the quote unquote millennials, some of you are, some of you <laughs> work for me. And, and we talk about this all the time because, because your vision is different from that which, which an older guest was interested in. Yet we have, I just, to finish up, yeah. we have to address both, right? Because it's a big meld right now. But the other thing you gotta build on is, if, if, if we're talking about Las Vegas, is the difference in, in reputation and what that does to us now. 30 years ago, I came to Las Vegas in 1972, and there was that welcome to Las Vegas sign and nobody gave it to now they put a parking lot in front of it, and people pay to have their pictures taken in front of it because you built up this this legacy of, of meaning that that defines the expectation of people when they come into town. There is something special. I go to Pechanga in Temecula, California, and they've got a beautiful facility, but Temecula doesn't do the same as Las Vegas. It just has a different ring to it, right? Uh, so there's something about Las Vegas, and we're, what we're seeing is a more morphing away from pure gambling into all kinds of other experiences like the the stadiums that are being built mm. the ways that we're bring we're leveraging the hotel rooms the facilities that we have in ways that were never thought of before and as someone that built their career in gambling in some ways i'm sad to see it but in a lot of ways i really admire the town for following the opportunity you mentioned the sign when we were redoing the las vegas strip I had this brilliant idea that we should do a new sign. <laughs> <laughs>
it caused quite a furor. The head, headline says, California consultant doesn't like our sign. <laughs> Ouch. Wow. We quickly decided that we did like it. <laughs> and you're right, because it's become an event of, of itself. Don, that goes, uh, you can go overboard the other way now, where in a place far, far away, you might want to, and a new sign might be appropriate, and we have people saying, no, we like that, you know, diamond-shaped sign on the side with the, with the quarters on top, that it becomes, <laughs> you can, in that, that sign, in that spot, that's sacred. But, it's only authentic ones. But there is, um, it, it can get pretty thin when you see it um, with a little pun in it, when you see it in a different location. I, I don't want to call anyone out in this forum, but, yeah, the, its uniqueness is very important. I think tourists are coming here for an experience more so than for gaming these days. And what what I think is going to continue to happen, is going to increase, is, is that I feel like Las Vegas is going to have to become, or at least our casinos are going to have to become almost caricatures of themselves and be that much more intensified in just providing truly unique experiences per property um, as opposed to focusing on gaming specifically. If, that, if we are finding that the ratio of you know, floor space is shrinking. So both... Casinos and nightclubs are designed to elicit an emotional response. And they both have that, it's so discretionary, it's almost purely discretionary spending. How's it different designing a casino space from a nightclub space? We, we, we have to be pretty careful here um, with that. Uh, they're different. And mm -hmm. my cautionary tale is going to be... Uh, uh, we've seen especially smaller casinos in Europe where a developer, an operator, wants the best of everything. Wants, uh, not the best of everything, the way we talked about before, but doesn't want to choose between the two. And so you mm -hmm. essentially turn it into a nightclub casino, mm -hmm. which can have uh, just catastrophic effect for the success of the casino. Okay. So I think there are real differences. I think that... Um, I think bars and nightclubs are places where people, you know, meet people, want to, uh, potential of meeting people. I think casinos are, um, they definitely have the kind of social aspect that we just talked about, but it is about gambling and it's about um, the, the actual casino floor. Watching, even if, even if it's, empathizing or living vicariously through another player who's doing exceptionally well or exceptionally poorly, um, it is a different experience. And it's, it's important, I think, I don't know whether you've encountered this, but as designers, to try to pull those apart and keep, those, um, keep them separate a little bit. We've never been faced with the challenge of trying to design a <laughs> casino that's also a nightclub. I've actually... Actually, that's not fair. We, <laughs> we do have some gaming tables in a couple. <laughs> no, in excess, we actually have a few gaming tables by the pool in a pavilion. Um, and I think we keep them relatively separate, but it does get rowdy. It does get, it, that is challenging. But ultimately, the design of both spaces, I think, is, is conceptually fairly similar. I mean, obviously, there are different requirements, but the intent is to, is to, is to make the environment as seductive and, and as appealing as possible, that you keep your guests in that space and they continue to either play or spend their money or buy more drinks or, or maybe get a table, which is probably the equivalent of um, spending several hours at, at a craps table. Um, I mean, we think of them fairly similarly, at least from a win perspective. Yeah. So having worked on a couple of, of the larger clubs here in town, for me, they're a little bit more over the top. They're, they're really an over the top experience. Sometimes I, I almost feel like when we're, when we're done with them, it, it's really unique. It, it, I mean, and, I, and I'm really referencing Jewel and Omnia because I, I worked on both mm -hmm. of them. And each one of them has a really <coughs> unique experience in the club. So it, it, it's not something you're gonna get anywhere else. And, and, and it's a differentiator. They're very segregated from the casino floor. They have a little bit of a different feeling. Uh, the market segment is distinctly different. It's really, I think clubs are really uh, pointing towards 21-year-olds to, to early 40s. And the floor, the floor is, is a little bit older, 35 and older on the strip. Do I have that number about right? You know the stats better than I do. Okay. 
So speaking of clubs, let me throw out the M word, which we've mentioned before, millennial. How does designing spaces to elicit an emotional response for, for, from a millennial differ from designing a space that would get a response from a baby boomer? Are, are you trying to elicit or enhance? Ah, okay. Because, for example, mm -hmm. when you think about Las Vegas architecture, as crass as it is, don't forget to look at the strip clubs that are off the strip. <laughs> Look at, at how they're built and how they're they're just ridiculous in their in, in their appearance and, and they're they're over the top. But the last I saw, there was like 1.4 billion dollars spent in strip clubs in Las Vegas last year. Wow! It, it's it's a large amount of money. And there, you're not trying to elicit; you're trying to enhance. You got a millennial, mm -hmm. you've got hormones, you've got the opposite sex, <laughs> and find the space. One of the, one of the top strip clubs in, in town is still the old sporting house over on Industrial Avenue. It was a, a giant workout place, hmm. and, and it's been a giant strip club for 20 years now. Very successful. Huh. Interesting. The part that Leonard. a lot of people yeah. don't like to talk about. Yeah. In, in reference to Las Vegas. But if you don't, we don't talk about the town. Yeah. That, it, that's, it, a, that's a part of why people come it, here. It, it's a big part. Although Sinead and Oliver, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't believe there will be any field research there. <laughs> okay. So, how's designing a space outside of Las Vegas different from Las Vegas? Let's start with the U.S. regional casino. How is that different from a Las Vegas strip casino? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty different. You know, you've got um, just not the same opportunity for integrated infrastructure, convention spaces aren't going to be as generally as much, the gaming's going to be different, no sports book, um, yeah. scale, for sure, for sure. Generally, outside of Las Vegas, the, the, the regionals and the Native Americans, let's not forget Native Americans, they're literally half of the gambling business now, $30 billion a year. Mm -hmm. But they have to be thinking about the recurring customer, the, per, the person that comes 30, 40, 100 times a year. So when you're coming like that, you're going to spend less, you're going to have lower expectations, you're going to want to be more comfortable. And so, and you've got to live on a tighter budget. Because I can come to Las Vegas once every three years and spend a bigger budget than I can go to the neighborhood casino twice a week and spend for. And if you look at uh, uh, some of the smaller places around town before uh, Red Rock was built, and they charge four bucks a bottle of water. Uh, the other places were built for, for economy, you know, with the movie theaters and the food courts and the, the totality of the experience you come there and spend the evening. If, for whatever crazy reason, uh, the Fertitta said we're going to put the Bellagio Lake in front of Boulder Station, would that work? That kind of spectacle with that repeat customer, would they just get jaded? Excuse me. I think they, they, they depend on each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, Bellagio, put where it is, works, but if you stick it out in East Jesus, it wouldn't work. Okay. Now, how about the other M word in gaming, which is Macau? Can we talk a little bit about how Las Vegas has influenced Macau and how Macau has influenced Las Vegas and how they're different from each other? Full of Chinese. All right. <laughs> On. <laughs> <laughs> on the gaming floor, the yeah. Chinese will spit. Someone of an Asian descent, this is always a difficult line to draw, but the, the Asian culture celebrates luck. It's as respectful, it's as respectable to be lucky as it is to be skilled, more so. And so people of that culture, of that upbringing, are naturally drawn the games of chance. In the, in the places I work with in Australia and elsewhere, we see, even in Australia, that 20% that of the customers are Asian, and they account for 70% of the revenue. You, you have to pay attention to that. You have to start changing your designs to favor that culture. We do that in Las Vegas, too. You know, the Asian holidays 
are highly respected. And the, they change out the Bellagio gardens specifically for that. We, we had a Chinese dragon in there for on, on the one of the ones that we did. And we had a lot of trouble because every other Asian that came in said we were spelling it wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they could nobody could agree on, on the characters. So there's a it's, it's a unique situation. And, and we end up with a culture clash. Mm -hmm. I worked with a club in Australia where I watched uh, the want a Caucasian man. I'm, always, <laughs> I'm old, so forgive me if I use the wrong terms. I <laughs> change every three years. Uh, he was livid because they put a Chinese uh, set of language on the ATM machine, mm. and in his mind. This country was being taken away from him. And when you go to local places, you not only have to follow those that are bringing their, their new pocketbooks and respect those of the new culture, you have to somehow uh, blunt the feeling of the old culture that they're no longer important. Because what we provide is that feeling of importance. And sometimes when we specialize and give it to one segment, we tend to give the image of taking it away from another. Ethan. Probably 50% of our work is in Asia, um, maybe a little more, quarter here, quarter everywhere else. And the, the explosion of, of gaming in Macau, and now as Macau has had its you know, engineer kind of tailing off, you now have the ripples in the pond and all the other locations like where you mentioned, Australia, uh, the US islands, uh, further north, we're seeing uh, growth also, um, but the 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 explosion of that it it defines our work wherever it is. Mm -hmm. So the, the the tendencies, the preferences that you just discussed um, are paramount for a project in Peru or in uh, really any other location, it, and I'm sure many parts of the U.S. as well. Yeah. For right. my clients, mm -hmm. we tend to have areas. So where we cater, where we cater to to the desires of certain groups, mm -hmm. and so you'll you'll hear terms like Asian Asian gaming pits, and and they actually you, we design them for that. We mm. will bring in a feng shui master mm -hmm. to look at them. We'll do it even in dining in dining establishments. Uh, they are they are. Uh, a, a, an important segment, but the trick is to appeal to everybody. And and when we're designing, we're always we're always asking questions, always trying to seek the right answer, and and and, and to come up with a great solution. I haven't so, okay. encountered that backlash that you're talking about, but I can. I'm not surprised by it. I just haven't personally come across it. And you got to be down. It's something that you only witness if you're on the floor. But it happens often. And for every person that gets incredibly irate, there's 10 more that feel the same way and haven't expressed themselves. Mm. To go back to your original question, mm -hmm. what influence has Macau had on Las Vegas? Mm -hmm. I would say almost none. Really? Yeah, what I would say is the billion people in China that are coming up with, with disposable income have had huge influence on Macau and Las Vegas, but that they're just expressions to allow that money to be spent. Uh, well, we what we notice in Macau is the government is interfering with the business of uh, gaming. Some would say that happens in the United States too. Yeah, this is, <laughs> this is, this is uh, you know, this is very arbitrary and they have the right to do it. Here you have, you know, groups that object to things. In China you don't. Very good, well, we have a very great audience here, and I would like to hear some questions from the audience for our panelists. You have one right here. Um, I have a question because now that we have um, those sports, the national sports teams coming in, how do you think that will affect the type of customer that comes into Vegas? Will that, that customer base be different? How will that affect um, gambling? Will those same people uh, be gambling or will they be eating or will they be 
um, after entertainment. How will that affect Vegas with all this, with the, um, the sports teams coming in? I'd like to hope that sports have a universal draw, I mean, across age groups, basically. So if the intent, I, you know, if, if, if millennials are attracted to it, I think so will baby boomers and, and anybody else, and they will continue to do what it is they do in casinos elsewhere, I would hope. I don't think it's going to help gaming at all, gambling, because the bulk of the people that are coming in are upper middle class, let's say, maybe earning fifty to $100,000 a year. If you pay for your flight, your hotel room, your meals, and the tickets, which I think are over $5 a piece to the stadium, right? There's, there's something over that? Something. Uh, I don't know that there's a lot left for the gaming machines. But I think that the larger way to look at this is what, what going back to Steve Wynn again, is that each of these things are only cash registers. A slot machine is a cash register. The, the point of sale at, at the restaurant is a cash register. As long as there's a margin on the transaction, I think Las Vegas has, has, has succeeded because it doesn't express an opinion about how you should spend your money. Just spend it. So I've, I've got a question about differentiation, and you talked about that with Steve Wynn earlier in terms of you know, all, all the things that he does right. Uh, I, I want to ask at that level, also at the Vegas level, which is could somebody else compete with Steve Wynn on that? He has differentiated himself as being the best, and you said you can only have one best. You know, and again, you know, so looking at it in, in that space, could another one of the you know one of the chains on the on, on the strip actually compete at that level and then at the vegas level to say um being as how gaming is going down as the as motivator what is the usp for vegas then uh unique selling point so what is the thing that makes vegas different from from the other places that they could go to so macau or or wherever else what what is the thing that's 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 left there the thing that's different is the sign up this is Las Vegas, the history of the excitement and the mystery and the sinfulness of the town. And there's no other place on earth that has that brand. It's like, could someone else build another Disneyland? Of course. But how are you going to take that, that history that's built up and move it over? And if someone tried to compete with, with Steve Wynn at the top, and let's say they're equal, they're only going to have half of that market. The person that's there is going to hold on to at least half. And it's going to be very difficult to justify the kind of investment that has been made in the win and the encore onward if you only get half that much business. Yes, I had a question in reference to what are a couple lessons that a hotel operator who's not in the casino business but is, is building hotels um, could take from your experience that they need to make sure that they make and put in their hotels? So I guess the question is, as we think about designing hotels that are non-gaming, what are some of the lessons that we can learn from Las Vegas? I think a lot of hotels, especially boutique hotels lately, go to great efforts to try to be unique and to provide very unusual experiences in terms of their design and in terms of their amenities. And a lot of them just fall short of being comfortable. I stayed in a hotel recently where they provided um, you know, shampoo and and uh, bath, um, bath soap and things like that in basically uh, chemical vials that were impossible to work with when you're in the shower because they roll over the place and you lose them and it looks really cool and we brought you know a couple home for some friends of ours because we thought they would like them and they thought they were amazing but they're completely useless <laughs> and I, I think that um, I, I think that the a lot of hotels try try to be novel and we need to rely on what has been proven and true and what is just intuitively comfortable and easy to use for guests, and that's something that Las Vegas has really figured out. You know, I want to I focus on how the casinos have influenced hospitality uh, from our point of view, and I think that one of the most obvious ways is the flexibility that's been built into the pool areas everywhere else and I remember when we were doing a you know in a closed pool area at Harrah's 
in Atlantic City, and it was one of the first ones that actually became a pool bar, nightclub-y kind of thing, and that was 15 years ago, something like that. Well, that aspect of pool of the pool areas has become a very big business, and with non-gaming uh, hotels, and it started actually for us when we were trying to add more reasons for people to stay at the at the hotel. So we would add, you know, there'd be restaurants at the pools, and then there, we could play with them at night all of a sudden, and that gave yet another opportunity to, to uh, for revenue. And I think that the, the hotels, I mean, we've done a lot of non-gaming hotels now, and quite frankly, a lot of them um, have been as a result of the work that we've done here, because we spent many, many years finessing and focusing on how the, the various spaces, particularly in, in, the, in the hospitality area with the pool areas, function and how many offerings and the variety of offerings that, that, that you can have. And so I think that's one of the major contributions, at least in our experience, um, that's influenced how uh, non-gaming hotels have evolved. And by the way, there's always evolution going on in every hotel. I mean, how many times have I gone to the, <laughs> to the win and encore? What happened to that club? What happened to that? Well, you know, there's a, there's, you know you're paying attention to your customers, and that's, that's, that's what's essential in all businesses. And, um, and I think Vegas, a lot of people here uh, have done really, really well with that, particularly when the Las Vegas Sands brought in Tal Beach. What a brilliant move. And then everybody else is behind the eight ball. And then Wynn tore out an, you know, an entrance so that he could put in the encore, uh, exp, you, know, the, you know, the beach club. And, you know, and these places are making you know, 40 to $50 million revenues uh, uh, and gross revenues annually. It's huge. It'll be very interesting to see what the next evolution will be. But anyway. Excellent. Um, so my question is about um, attracting millennials, in particular to you, John, about the gaming experience. So given how, you know, millennials grow up with social media, Facebook, and the whole social gaming experience without having to step inside a casino, um, how is Vegas really going to capitalize on that to keep bringing in the under 40s and develop that demographic in the future? Well, I think that reimagine our spaces as being the ultimate in social media where people can interact physically, where the, our devices, and there's no question that, that these devices have changed expectations completely. But what we see is, is it doesn't make people antisocial. It allows people to select who they're social with. I don't have to be social just with the people in my proximity. And when I look forward, I see the gaming areas becoming much, much more specialized much more team-oriented or adversary-oriented competitions, cooperations, that sort of a thing. Uh, sharing, taking, I mean, we, can, we can express a lot of greed by, by allowing people within confines to steal from each other. So th there's a lot of opportunity to create brand new experiences in, in, in our physical social spaces. I think we'll also see a lot of third party, even more third party brands and even micro branding within spaces, not just you know, hotels on a property, but I, I think there's no ex extent that there would be too much of that where you're starting to pick up on those platforms that resonate. And that, that's really a, already happening, I mean, in talking with our clients. I think it is. I think we're seeing it. I mean, there's inquiries out there. We're talking to people about creating basically gaming lounges where it's not pure gaming with, with rows of slots on the floor, along with what, what John talks about with, with creating different kinds of competition or gaming environments. But it includes everything, right? They're mixing it up with, with bars and gaming. And I mean, we've had slot machines on bars for a long time. But this is different. This is a place where people can gather, be comfortable. I think, I think all, all of the major companies are looking into this. They're experimenting with it. There's one at MGM Grand right now. If you're, if you're walking around, it's called Level Up Lounge. Uh, I don't have any reports on it. 
yet we're all going in and looking at it and, and trying to get a feel for whether or not they're on the right track, as I'm sure they are. So there is, it, there's, there's a lot of experimentation going on right now to try and, and solve this, this problem, this opportunity. One more question, right here. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question about building a new resort. So you did speak about having a brainstorming session with your customer before that starts. And my question is in two parts. I think for me to relate to it, how might you have the product? When you move from planning to implementation, you're describing the project that you're actually building right now. How would you describe, what language would you use to describe that kind of project? And where does the inspiration come from? You're the one with the big project. I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I understand. Tell me a little more what you mean by the language of the... Uh, so, let's say you're building a new project. Describe it to me. I will show you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, uh, our practice, um, and a number of, number of these other practices in this field, don't come at it with a single idea of what we want it to look like. Yeah. The first thing we're going to do is to establish a aesthetic neighborhood, a planning neighborhood, um, and show you not a million options, but a good three or four, just to almost a Ouija board of, you know, does this feel right, or does this feel right, or does this feel right. Um, and they'll be, they'll be very different. They'll be in, in corners of the aesthetic world. And then we're going to engage you and see what you think. Yeah. And you'll you'll say, we're not gonna we're not gonna do a Monte Carlo theme not Monte Carlo Carlo here, Monte you know. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna do that kind of European theme here. We're also not gonna do that fantastic um, escapist half mile tall tower. We're gonna do this one over here. So we'll start in very different neighborhoods. And really without a too much of a a dog in the fight and see how that, how you react to it. And then we may narrow it based on options around that. I would disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> because if, if we're going to create that next thing, Jay Sarno, Steve Wynn did not look around and say, what am I going to like? They say, what can I imagine that people will come to? I think that the next great innovation is probably going to come from a female because we've missed that whole demographic that we, we've not had that perspective amplified in the way that men have done and I, I suspect that there's a tremendous unserved emotional market beneath that that there's a different kind of emotional fulfillment for females than there is for men. That's a developer operator <laughs> she said the next big resort. The next but big I, I, I agree with uh, what, what you said. That you know, design and construction, development, yeah. operation, these are all different corners of it. Also, I, I can give a different example um, where we have one client. We don't necessarily. I mean, it's different when you have to try to appeal to, to different people and not really necessarily you know what they're looking for to start. We just completed a project in China, uh, in Macau, uh, the Wynn Palace in Kotai, and w the initial charge from Mr. Wynn was, he didn't know what it looked like yet, he just said, I want you to honor China. And my boss, Roger Thomas, our Executive Vice President of Design for the Interiors Department, um, who's also a, you know, a great student of the arts, knows uh, knew about Xinmazari, which is the European response to uh, Chinese and, and kind of generally um, Asian design in the late 17th and 18th centuries. Um, and we didn't want to just replicate that. We decided to interpret it in a contemporary way. So basically we looked at traditionally kind of Chinese motifs and we interpreted them our own way. And that was the, the kind of the beginning of the, of the Kotai project. And then we decided or, or realized that what is really lacking in Macau is space. And so we tried to provide our guests the most, the most expansive views and, and 
accommodations possible, and that was kind of what drove our project as a design. We worked on that, and, and we had a direction from Steve on the private gardens that they should be big because, he, in his opinion, the people were not used to that. I'm not sure he's right, uh, but time will tell. So we have these private gardens, which are quite large. 150 feet long yeah. with reflecting pools the whole way. Yeah. yeah. So we'll see. Our experience is that we get talked to about from our clients all the time, and they're a source of inspiration. You know, we don't come up with the ideas for what to do. They do. And we're just trying to follow suit. And I think that that's the right thing to do. Wonderful. And great words to close on, I think. Before we leave, I'd like to turn this over to Oliver Lovett for a moment, who's going to have some words to say for the CAS contingent. Thank you, Dave. When I started studying the area of Las Vegas about seven or eight years ago, my interest was in customer loyalty. And what I found that the most powerful form of loyalty was emotional loyalty. So my challenge was then, if we know that people respond to emotional uh, loyalty as the most powerful tool, how do we create it? And part of that is it's shaped by our environments. And whether, um, and over the course of the last, I don't know, seven or eight years, we look at casino design, and we know that it's moved from places where people do things to places where people feel things. And those of us who, are, who have the, 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 the cognizance, I suppose, to understand this, ask the question, how does this make me feel? So the question for my cast group, when you're going and walking into the casinos over the course of the week, look at things and ask the question, how does this make me feel? And I suppose the, the discussion this evening, as a precursor to that, is these are the guys who are behind that. These are the minds that have interpreted the emotional loyalty, in theory, to physically creating those spaces in Las Vegas, which have since been exported around the world. And I think for those of us who've been here tonight, we've witnessed a real rare treat. I have to say, I think the conversation tonight was at a, a level that you don't get very often uh, in, in places like this. And I thank you all for coming to speak this evening. I thank the UNLV and the uh, CLETI and the Centre for putting on this event with us. And I thank everybody for coming this evening um, because it's a Sunday evening. And finally, Dave, thank you very much. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you to our panel. Thank you to all of you. It's been wonderful. Thank you very much.